that hunger and alleviating hunger would become a single voting issue, just the way reproductive rights are or the Second Amendment rights are, where people actually would show up and vote for a politician that was talking about ending hunger and that had solutions and had policies that would do it. And right now, it's still a third rail. People don't want to... They don't want to talk about it. So, Tom, you, you just talked about some of the things that work. And I think a lot of the people in this audience would want to know, through your adv advocacy on anti-hunger, what works and what doesn't work in this movement besides not only getting involved in the political campaign that you just described? Right. How can the average person make things work? Right. So, I think the, the way that we have been talking about hunger, we, we uh, a place at the table, our, our, our film turned into a, a, an organization. and. Um, we're really looking at communication and how people communicate around the issue of hunger. We worked with an organization called Frameworks. It's a, a think tank in Washington. It's a bunch of PhDs that are really smart. They're uh, socialists and anthropo uh, anthropologists, and, and they're thinking in terms of how to communicate this issue, what frames to actually use to communicate this issue. And the idea of giving something to someone doesn't really resonate. The idea of why ending hunger is great for society, something that it resonates. But when you actually talk about a system that is failing, that's something that really resonates. So Karen kind of touched on this earlier. So we have a food system and a food movement that, you know, we're looking at production, we're looking at means of production, we're looking at ways to, to, to give young farmers a hand up and things like that. But if we're going to create a food system by which people who are struggling can't tap into that, the system's failing. It's not, a, it's not a whole system because you're, you're, you are, look, you know, in this country, we produce calories that are cheap, but nutrition is expensive. If you go to a farmer's market, if you go to buy, you know, fruits and vegetables, it's a lot more expensive than buying processed foods. Well, that goes into how we choose to subsidize our food system. But in, in, in essence, we have a system that's not reaching everyone. So let's, let's look at our food system like the electrical grid, all right? There was a time in this country where we, we didn't have a, a grid that supplied everyone. Um, I think FDR started the Tennessee Valley Authority, which actually brought electricity to uh, Appalachia, which was the last, I think, uh, area in this country that didn't have electricity. But nowadays, we, we, we go into our homes, you build a house, you build a new community, whatever it is, and you know that you can plug into the electrical grid and it works. That's a system that works. That benefits everyone. That's a government program that benefits every single American because they can plug into computers, they can order food at home, they can go on Tinder if they want, whatever it is, but you have a system that powers our, our, our society. Now, if, 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 you, if you look at our food system, our food system's not doing that. Everyone in, so in society can't tap into that. And so when you start talking about systems as a way of, of, of explaining how the system's broken, then people start to, start to sort of perk up. And they realize that it's not an individual. You know, this idea of individualism and blame the person who is hungry. Someone, someone on, on Twitter just this morning made some comment, and I said, you know, about people having to deal with their own mistakes. And my response was, being born into poverty is not a mistake. And so we need to talk about systems. We need to talk about, about a, 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 again, a system that, that everyone could benefit from because unless we all could benefit from that it's it's not working for all americans and if it's not working for all americans it's really not a system worth actually uh, uh you know perpetuating you know tom earlier in the program lovely randall of our staff in the city of elizabeth spoke about certain policies and things that we're doing in the city of elizabeth to address hunger and backstage you and i were talking about the state policies that the state just passed things uh, some some interesting bills. So so are these bills on the state and federal level addressing hunger uh, sufficient? What's working? What's missing? Because people like Lovely on our staff have to implement these ideas. Right. Well, they are. Um, so New Jersey uh, Congress just passed a whole host of anti-hunger uh, um, bills. Um, I'm sure Governor Murphy will sign that bill. Um, one of them actually affects college campuses. Um, so uh, um, there's a, a, a campus Campus Hunger Free Act, that's part of the, of, of the bill. Um, it uh, gives a, a million dollars to actually uh, create pantries um, on cal uh, campus universities. Um, also, a whole host of other um, uh, related um, programs that will alleviate uh, hunger on, on campuses. Um, plus, there's also a lot of bills in there dealing with, with um, uh, food waste, um, 
uh, farmers, um, hungers. It's, I, I think, a, a 27 different bills. Um, and so this is, uh, you know, where on the state level, um, there's definitely work that's being done. On the federal level, there's, uh, there's work that's being done. One great program, so again, this idea w of where government actually works. It's a great program called the Double Bucks Program. The Double Bucks Program allows, if, if you are a, a SNAP recipient, you can take your benefits, you can go to a farmer's market, okay? And if you spend $20 on fruits and vegetables, so this is an incentive for people to use their dollars to buy healthier food. If you spend $20 or $40, whatever it is, you can go and get an, another coupon for the same amount of money. So if you're spending $20, you get a coupon for $20. The great thing about this, now it doubles up the amount of dollars that, that if you're using SNAP that you have to spend on healthy food, plus that money goes to farmers. It doesn't go to some big food company somewhere. That money stays in state, because it's a state-run program. You know, the federal government funds it, it's still run in the state. That money stays in the state because it goes into the farmer's pocket. It goes into the farmer's pocket, that farmer is actually spending money on equipment and seeds and is able to pay their workers. And so now you actually create an economy. So those dollars that are coming in are staying in the state and actually helping the economy work. And so um, there's a lot of great programs that actually do work. Um, but, but yeah, it takes, I think, partnerships between not only states and, and, and federal government, but, but local communities as well. So Tom, in talking about the uh, programs that work, what, what's the cost to society in not addressing hunger? I mean, it, really high profile issues such as national security, healthcare, that's all affected by not addressing uh, hunger. C can you deal yeah, with that Yeah, yeah, so, so last election, um, you know, we were doing a lot of work to try to get uh, politicians to talk about hunger, and people would say to me, Tom, were you disappointed that you didn't hear um, our you know, candidates talking about hunger or talking about food? I said, no, I, I heard them every single day talk about it. And he said, well, well, how? I said, well, I've heard national security talked about a lot. And they kind of scratched their head and looked puzzled, and they said, well, right now, 25% of the recruits that show up to fight in, our, fight in our military and keep us safe, 25% wash out because they're not fit to fight. I testified in front of Congress with a, 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 a general um, from Mission, it's an organization called Mission Readiness, and he um, introduced this, this issue to me that, that uh, hunger is rampant in the military as well, um, especially if you're living off, off base. Um, so our national security is affected because of hunger. Um, so question about, about health care. I heard health care talked about all the time. Currently, we are spending $200 billion a year on healthcare-related issues that are directly have a direct correlation to food and diet. $200 billion a year. So if we want to actually reduce healthcare costs, which you always hear talked about, we need better diet and better food. And again, we need that food to get to places where people actually can engage. Karen talked about food deserts. We actually need to create incentives, and actually, I think one of the bills actually creates incentives for supermarkets to get fresh food into communities that are underserved right now. And actually, now. we're working on it in Elizabeth in certain areas as well, making sure there's supermarkets. Right. Um, so I, I heard food issues and hunger talked about all the time. It's just I have a different lens that I'm looking at it. Um, and so this is, again, part of our mission to get people to sort of understand when they hear issues of, 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 of race and class and poverty and hunger, um, it, it's all, it's all can be looked at as, as, as uh, sort of very topical issues that we all care about. Um, right now, climate change is something where every American is at risk of losing their job for a period of time, um, where they will have to actually maybe go on food stamps or SNAP because they're out of work, and we saw it with Sandy. Um, it, it could happen if you look at Puerto Rico People were out of work for months on end. Now, this is also, I'm, I'm sort of, I'll digress for a second. Right now, the, the SNAP program is a counter-circular program. So often you'll hear people, the seniors especially, will say, well, I, I know I qualify for benefits, but I don't want to take them away from somebody else. That's not the way SNAP works. It's not a pile of money, and when, it's over, when it runs out, it runs out. If the need is there, it meets the need. And so when you hear politicians talk about block granting SNAP, what that means is they actually want to turn it into a program where each state gets a certain amount of money and the governors have a lot of discretion as to how to use that money. And so that's the system that they have in Puerto Rico right now, where it's a block grant. And so after the hurricane, they ran out of money. And this is why, again, uh, 
when we talk about hunger and we talk about ways to end hunger and we talk about programs, there are politicians that are actually looking to hurt these programs because they just want to shrink government. What they really want to do is give some governors a discretionary fund that they can actually use. Um, and that's, that's just not going to help alleviate this problem. So, um, so, so as a mayor, Tom, the block grant story you just told is dead on. You're absolutely right. And that's one way to eliminate funding for these programs because they'll keep reducing the block grants every year. Right. So do you, do you in your vision see hunger as a single issue at some point? You talked about that earlier. And, and as individuals, w what can they do to end hunger? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, would, I would like it to be a single issue. Um, I would like to get more, um, uh, you know, we have I don't know, maybe 20 Democrats running for, for the presidency. I, I, would, I would love to, <laughs> to have a hunger summit. I would love to actually hear each of them address this issue. Um, and uh, so, I, yeah, one day I hope it becomes a single uh, voting issue. I hope for a lot of, uh, of Americans, maybe if it's not the first thing that you're going to pull a, a ballot for, maybe it's not the second, but it could be the third. Um, I'd like to see it sort of rise up there a little, a little closer to, to, to not your heartstrings, but, but understanding that, it, that this does benefit the entire country. So what do, the other question was? Well, basically, what could you tell this audience? If, oh, oh uh, so, so listen. Something? this it, 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 it's great to do that can drive around Thanksgiving and Christmas. That's, that's, that's great. That's not really going to move the needle. We have to use our voices. We have, to, we have to actually demand from our politicians that they fix this issue, that they focus on this issue, and that's something that is worth, it's, it's worth fixing. But again, we, we need to actually speak up. You know, what we're, we're seeing, quite frankly, is, is an erosion of democracy. If enough people care about, I mean, something like 95% of the people want to see background checks for guns, but for some reason they can't pass this bill. That's an erosion of democracy. When 95% of the people want something and it's not happening, that is, is uh, these are our votes that are just not being counted. Our voices are not being counted. They're not being counted because we're not raising them loud enough. And it's something that I found out when I started doing the work and going to Congress and working, um, I'd go back six, seven times a year, eight times a year, and I kept going back, I kept going back. And I, I did it because I, I felt that someone, and I, I just felt personally I needed to do it. That was kind of my mission. And, and uh, George Miller, who was a representative from, from California, who's, uh, when I first went to Congress and I testified in front of his committee, um, he was retiring. And I was at a press conference with him and he took me aside and he said, you know, Tom, uh, you keep showing up and we recognize this. They said a lot of celebrities, they come here, they do a photo op, we don't see them again. They said, you keep coming up, and that's, you keep coming back here, and, and we are, we are uh, grateful for it and, and recognizing it. And so this is my message, is everyone's got to show up, and you have to keep showing up. You know, it's great to do a march, but what are you doing the following day? What are you doing the following month, the following year? We can't just engage because it's, it, it, it feels like it's a, you know, we're rallying against something, the resistance is strong, we're going to rally. You know, at, at some point, um, we, we all just realized, need to really look at, at how this country was formed and understand that, that democracy can continue to work if we all demand that it works. So Tom, there's a lot of young people in this audience here today and a lot of college students, high school students, and uh, we have a few minutes. We would like to give them the opportunity to maybe ask you a couple of questions, and there's people out here with microphones. so. It's, I, can, I can see some of you, if you raise your hand, uh, we can call on you if you'll state your name and ask Tom a question on some of the things here discussed. Stand up, anybody? Over there in the audience, in the, in the aisle. Hi, first, thank you for coming. Um, the information that you presented was very valuable. I'm here with a group of middle school students, eighth graders, 13, 14 years old. Um, a lot of times our young people don't know how they can get involved or what they can do to help. Um, can you shed some light on some of that? Yeah, you know, one thing I would love to see, um, and I just don't have the bandwidth to organize it, I would love to see st students high school students, grammar school students, I would love to see them actually get on buses and go to Washington and actually demand, number one, as a student, one thing you could demand is, is better, a 